Welcome to The Long Game, where time, effort, and energy matter. It's a podcast I talked about for way too long, and I finally decided to start. And when you're starting something new, there is no better place or better person to turn to than someone who can commiserate with your experiences, who's also a friend and a colleague, Trisha Clay, who is the Chief Information Officer at Hudson County Community College in Jersey City, New Jersey. Trisha, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Milos, and thank you for inviting me. I always look forward to discussions about leadership, and especially for those of us in higher education. Um, so as, as Milos said, that I am a CIO at Hudson County Community College. I came on the long and winding road, which I think everyone does. We all say, I didn't take the typical path. Um, I lived most of my life in Pennsylvania, and my original career path was to be an early childhood and elementary education teacher. Um, I never actually taught full time. I, um, I went back to work in a manufacturing plant where I worked with computers. And then later on down the road, I went to um, an institution not unlike St. Peter's, uh, DeSales University in Pennsylvania, that's a private four-year Catholic institution, and I worked there for almost 18 years in IT the whole time, moved my way around that, um, and worked my way up to the top of the IT department there over time. Um, I, I started with desktop and then moved my way to doing um, ERP, let's say jack of all trades or Jane of all trades. And um, I earned my MBA at the Sales University and then later on decided to move closer to the big city. Uh, as, as we will both say, you can see Manhattan from where we sit. Well, sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> and because uh, I was ready to, to be more of a leader and less of a manager. And so that, that's how I, I found myself in Jersey City and found myself at a really dynamic uh, urban landscape, quite different from my young life. So. I'm glad you brought up manager, leader, not a manager. Could you uh, talk to us a bit about, you know, the most apparent differences between two? And I absolutely agree with you. There are significant differences between the two. Well, I think some of it is uh, an aptitude uh, and a desire thing. It can be placed upon you being a manager, depending on how much input you have into making decisions and long-term goals. But I think you're, you can be born a leader. You can learn how to manage things. Managing to me is more about uh, the detail and less about the vision where, you know, I think you get to a certain point. If you really want to lead the organization forward, you have to be a leader, which is more about the big picture and trying not to get lost in all that detail that you learned how to do when you were learning to be a manager. So uh, I think I can throw the list of my questions out the window because just, we think the same, we think alike. And you, I know you made another really good point. Uh, that I would like you to expand on if you, if you wouldn't mind for a minute. Um, leaders, are they born or are they made? And obviously everyone can get better at something, but I've heard people make different kinds of analogies. You know, I can spend 15 or 18 hours a day playing basketball, I'm never gonna be LeBron, right? Is right. there, what, what is your take and what has your experience been when it comes to truly exceptional leaders that you have worked with and, and learned from? Well, the interesting part is, right, we interact with leaders not when they were little kids. So we might say, oh, that we were born a leader, but you really don't know. And I, in my own life, as a little, like a little kid, I was, I'm an only child, and I was bossy. So I wouldn't necessarily say I was a leader, but I was bossy. And I went from being a bossy little kid to more a shy older kid. And I, I, kind of, I think those two things converge in my life. So I do think that people are born with leadership qualities that you can 
work on and kind of enhance in your own in yourself. But I do think there are people that are, I'm sure you've had this, there are people that you think have great qualities and they're talented, they work for you, they're, they manage maybe a team, but they're not interested in being a leader. You know what I mean? Yep. I think you have to want to lead people in order to, even if you ha were born a leader, you have to want to do it in order to really be good at it. Do yeah, you agree? I, I absolutely agree. Because there are certain people who walk into a room or, or they speak in the way they speak in certain meetings or in certain sessions, then you just make you think about things differently. Some of that is innate, certain things you can't necessarily teach. Uh, but I do believe that we all have opportunity to kind of improve and grow over years. But you're absolutely right. I think you hit on, on a really interesting, I'm, a, I'm an only child as well. Uh, but you hit on a, two interesting points. One is you really don't know who they were when they were two, four, six, nine. You don't know. Uh, you seeing them now, which is often results of both decades of, you know, then we go into a whole different conversation, nature versus nurture, right? Right. Uh, but another point you, you hit on, which I think is really important and it's critical, is you have to want it. But you have to want to make a different kind of difference. You have to be willing to sometimes sacrifice yourself, actually often. You have to be willing to take all the blame, but none or very not as much of a credit when the time comes. There's also huge differences in how you put people um, in front of you, how you work for them and support them to be successful um, as opposed to them just executing your orders, or your directives. And there are huge differences. And I absolutely agree with what you've said. So um, when it comes to, again, the, the world we live in, and you and I talked about this um, earlier, uh, and this term that I'm personally not a fan of, right? The new normal, because I don't think that anything about this is normal. Uh, because people are by very nature, most of them, you have introverts and extroverts, I get that. But overall, we're social beings and we want to be around others, whether it's in a village or in a small town or a big city. Uh, you always want to be part of a community. In these, let's say, last month and a half or two months that we've been living and that could last a while longer, whether it's a few more weeks or a few more months or, God forbid, longer than that, what do you see as areas where you spend most of your time? you, your team, your organization, what are you kind of focused on the most? What are your current priorities? Well, right now, a lot of what we're doing really is just supporting people to become more comfortable using the tools that we've, all, we've always had, or maybe we're enhancing uh, the use of that we're comfortable with that many people are not at all comfortable with. Right. And I think, um, some of it that the have being an IT person, we do change management all the time. And this was a change that nobody wanted. And, you know, it's bad enough when we put in a new system and it, we maybe don't communicate it well. Right. And people get upset, but this is like your whole world changed. We're in front of you. Like, and I've said, we're, we're putting tires on the car as we're driving the car a lot of times. Like, okay, guys, we're all going to be remote. We have all these tools, but we, didn't, we weren't able to follow the process that we normally would to make sure A to B to C to D works perfectly and smoothly. So I, I've always said that in IT, we have to be like part counselor in support, right? We have to be part counselor and part technician. But now we really have to do that because we have to be the ones saying it's going to be okay. Well, I have to do this, you know, Zoom meeting and I don't know how it's, it's going to be okay. Well, I can't get connected. Okay. So, you, you know, try to use your phone. Oh, okay. That works, you know, and, and that's just a very simple example, but we're back to basics of we have all these tools and things that, no one connects the dots except us normally. And now everybody has to be worrying about how the dots get connected, if that makes sense. 
You, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, hub and spoke model, right? It's one of the ways I've always thought about IT or CIO role in particular, because we're in the middle of every single functional area, right? We know what finance needs to be successful in academic affairs and enrollment and admissions and everybody else, because they're coming to us in different ways. Now, I think this is slightly different, like quite different. Wasn't planned, it's on a larger scale. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of fear across different homes. Some people may be dealing with actually folks who are ill. Some folks are dealing with other, uh, whether financial or, or other insecurities. And then on top of that all, you expect them to learn something new that is not necessarily on pace with their levels of comfort. So you're absolutely right. Being able to hold somebody's hand virtually, right? Six feet apart <laughs> or, or, or farther right. apart, but hold their hand and help them along on this journey is, is absolutely critical. Now, holding people's hands, supporting them, providing some guidance and support. What do you see as other side of that coin, right? What are some of the opportunities that you and your teams are leveraging now that you maybe didn't in the past, right? The iron is very hot and they say you strike while the iron is right. hot. Are we getting different opportunities across IT to be given certain opportunities in certain seats, in certain uh, bodies and organizations? Uh, are we getting increased funding? Again, one of the things that I've seen in my research over the years across higher ed alone, alone, North American higher ed, way too many organizations invest 2% of their operating expenses of their operating budget on a function that now 100% of the university needs to survive, right? This, this right. doesn't make sense. I'm not saying you need to invest right. 50, but 10 would be nice, right? Are you seeing right. any of these opportunities? Yeah. Are you having those conversations at this time? Well, it's definitely made us more visible and look prescient in certain set like oh wow you said that was really important now I totally understand how it's important right and uh, another you know you you don't like the term new normal I can't stand the term digital transformation or if you know in my uh, at my age the paperless office which has been coming for 40 years now by the way paperless office right well, now all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, I get why we have this digital process and this digital process and you guys wanted to put this digital process in the, in, in the middle. I'm like, yes, that's right. Because taking a shot with your phone of this piece in the middle is a, is a real bummer. You know, that is not a fun to, to do. So I, yes, are we, we're seeing increased funding I mean, for simple, I don't know if it's simple, for things like our students need devices. They don't have them, you know. Right. Our faculty staff in many cases don't have devices. And that's a real eye opener. I mean, I, we know that we're dealing with uh, a largely immigrant low, and low income, uh, very economically challenged group of students, but it turns out some of our faculty and staff have similar challenges or, you know, they, they don't have internet or good, good high speed internet at their homes. So it's, there's things that we can help manage and we're, it's way more visible why that's important. You know, things like phones. Oh, well, I have a cell phone. I can forward my phone to my cell phone, but now I called you and now you have my cell phone number. I don't like that very much, right? Oh, there's these things called soft phones. We thought that was a good idea. Oh, right. That is a good idea, as it turns out. Yeah, yeah there's something else so you can do. All of that, all that landscape is going to keep changing. And what I'm fascinated about is what emergency things we do because we have to that just stay there as part of the baseline. And I think it's our job as technology leaders to, even if we're saying, look, we did this as like a patch to get you over the hump, but if we do this one other thing, you can keep doing this when we go back to campus and it saves you, you know, 
20% of your time. That that argument is a lot easier to make now that now that we've done it the other way, if that makes sense. Absolutely. You know, you're making a comment about soft phones. Um, yes, there are other things you can do other than star six, seven, right? And, right. and, and it's also really interesting. I agree with you. I'm not a fan of digital transformation term, the way it's used and abused and misused because it often ends up being just digitizing a document that's still 97 pages long. That still requires seven different signatures. Oh, but now it's a PDF. That's not ADA compliant, by the way. Right. Right. Not really what we're supposed to be doing. And, and you um, imagine like we had two, we had two days to do this really. It was a decision on Wednesday and we had Thursday and Friday and everybody was online on Monday. Um, imagine if we had two, four, six months where everybody bought in and we did it the right way. We trained people. Right. We identify all of these bottlenecks, network connectivity, age of equipment or lack of equipment to begin with. Uh, I think we would all be better off, but I, you're absolutely right. I think the comments of where we are and what we're forced into, as opposed to what direction we choose to pursue collectively as an organization or as, as an industry um, have two different outcomes. Now, towards the end of your last answer, you mentioned, you know, how could this go and, and be expanded thoughtfully into a larger strategic conversation. What are your thoughts again, right? Hindsight is always 2020 and none of us have the uh, magic eight ball. Um, well, I actually had an eight ball recently that I threw out because I didn't like the answers. Every time I would flip it, it was always negative. I'm like, no, this has to go. But uh, what are your thoughts on the future of life and work? But I ask life first because I think this has also given some opportunities to spend some more time with family, to have those meals together, to do certain things that necessarily, especially in greater New York City area, many of us have taken for granted in years past. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's focused a laser on those things that you thought were really important that now you can't do. And the things that you didn't think about and how they did add value, like, oh, I could go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and I could walk around with my family. And, I, you know, I, can I look at the pictures? Sure, I can look at the pictures, but I can't experience it in the same way. You know, I, I can still go to the park, but I can't go to the park. And I'm not really a sports person, but, you know, I, I can't go to the ballpark. I can't watch people play sports. Um, you know, I can't just go and meet friends for a coffee or a drink or, you know, I know Zoom happy hour is better than nothing, but it's not the same thing, right? But, yeah. but, it's, but I think many of those things, I, I've seen interesting conversations actually about people, how people dress. And you'll notice, like, I have my business attire actually on. I do that for myself deliberately. But I've noticed a lot of conversation about why is it that we dress like this for our office anyway? Like, <laughs> does it really matter? I think I'm too, I'm like too far gone to go back. But there are those kind of things that like, I felt like I had to, you know, listen to a podcast in my car while I stopped at Dunkin' Donuts and did this and this. And maybe for some people that still is a critically important thing. And maybe it's not. Or, you know, I obviously did not need to go to the grocery store three times a week. I have learned that I do not need to do that. You can right. plan these things out, right? right. Or, or to stockpile. I think it's going to be different for each person in some ways. But what's going to be interesting is what, what are those common things? Right, or, or to stockpile toilet paper or, or some of these other things that still puzzle me. Seven weeks in, I'm like, well, well, I don't understand it, but I guess, I guess we'll figure it out. But you're right, you're right. And then how many memes and pictures have we seen online of people with you know, suits and ties and then down there in flip-flops and the shorts, right? Because right. that's what you're expected, right? Talking about uh, the culture that you're part of, right? That's what's culturally expected. Those are the cultural norms. And sometimes you just follow them um, without ever really questioning as to why do we do that? Like I, one of the things as, as a guy that I always, I mean, I wear them. 
but not always uh, uh, with great enjoyment are ties, right? Right. If you really think about it, it's, I mean, it's a piece of cloth, often silk, that, you know, it's, it's, you know, tightens you around your neck and it just hangs over your buttons. Like, how bad could it be if the buttons on my shirt are visible? Right? Right. But Who invented that? <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I've heard different stories. I'm imagining it's fashion details. So it had to be the French, but who knows? So Italians, but right. I'm going to look into that. But speaking of culture, um, what have what have your experiences been on the impact on the power right as as late and great peter drucker used to say um culture eats strategy for breakfast how do you see cultures in organizations changing after this when we come out right there's a light at the end of the tunnel we're all hoping it's not an oncoming train right but when we finally right. get out of this tunnel um how do you believe that the cultures will either enable and support this transformation or perhaps hinder it in a, in a way or two? What I'm hopeful of is that the culture of change where, you know, the, the dreaded, we've always done it this way. Since we did, like, like you're saying, in two days, change the entire way we work or the entire way we learn whether that be for the better or worse, depend, you know, obviously depends on who you're asking. But in many cases, it has changed things for the better. You know, we've, ret- we've taken uh, hurdles out of the way that, like you're saying, why do we need this 95-page PDF? It, you know, is there 60 pages of that that's just there because, well, it always was there, and it's pretty easy for me to make, take that thing and make it into a PDF. Um, you know, what I, when I talk about, when I, I try to avoid saying digital transformation, what I always say is let's not make something a did, uh, like take a paper and now we have a digital paper. You know, how can we make this an actual electronic form or digital form where we're gathering what we need and making the steps as few as, as possible, like looking at it for what is purpose. That's what I always try to say, you know, it's many, many ways I'm trying as a CIO in higher education to get out of the way to not to not be a barrier to students to not be in the way of what faculty really being talented in educating students. How can we not be a barrier. And I mean, this shows where there are hurdles that maybe before you're just like, yeah, yeah, you take that form down to the registrar's office, you get it signed, then you'll be able to do this other thing. Now it's like, oh, well, you can't do that. So, you know, I hope that we can, through this process, and now, like you said, you're saying, oh, thank God, we finally get to be in an office where I, you know, I can just stand next to you with my cup of coffee, maybe six feet apart, but, you know, stand next to you with my cup of coffee, but not have the hurdle there because it somebody put it put this paper together 20 years ago and we've just carried it over right and i think in higher education it's really critical is there's a lot of scrutiny about why we do the things we do why we spend the money the way we spend it and i think us being on the inside we probably know where a lot of the money goes where other people are like i can't even imagine where all this money goes we're like have you ever bought Wi-Fi? <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> right. 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 Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, back to, you know, digital transformation comments, because um, there are no alternatives, right? We're not taking a stone tablet and a chisel in, in 2020 right. and beyond. Like, that's just the world we're in. We need to find a way to um, integrate it and reduce friction. I think our, one of our primary jobs as a CIO or as IT professional as a whole is to reduce friction. Right. If people need to use our services, software, applications, and it's frustrating, it's friction, it's I'm getting a headache an hour before I have to sign on to that system to use it because it's cumbersome, then it doesn't solve the problems that it's meant to solve and doesn't provide the value and the solutions that I think we're tasked with providing. Now, obviously, culture, essential, uh, big wheel, very big wheel, and it moves slowly. 
There's a group of people that you and I are fortunate in, and we, I think, take our positions uh, with a lot of gratitude to be in positions to influence some of that future, no matter how wide or thin that slice might be today. What are your thoughts on leadership, overall leadership, and, and impact of leadership in shaping the culture or nudging it in a particular direction and therefore impacting the overall success of that business or that organization as a whole? I think your, your job in leadership is a lot, like you're saying, is to reduce friction. Whatever, whatever organization you're leading, you want, you hopefully have a vision of where you want to go. And it's your job, my job, to take the friction out of the system. Like I, I often say to the people who work with me, on my teams is it's my job to get out of your way to sometimes be an umbrella for the rest of the leadership and keep them out of your, out of what you're doing so you can be productive. But I, I think in leadership, a lot of it is setting those priorities about what's really important and how you spend your time, how you speak about people, you know, about their value about, you know, sometimes people make a mistake. I'm a leader. I might not have done that thing the way you did it. And now I'm, you know, at the table and getting chewed out for what, you know, Sally did, whatever it is. But it's my job to say, yeah, sorry. I'm, you know, I'm sorry that that didn't work out. Obviously that did not go the way that we want it to go. I'm going to get a lot farther by taking the heat for that than I am being like, well, you know, that Sally, she really messed this one up. At least that, that's in my opinion, because I can go back to Sally and I can talk to her about how she didn't do something the right way, but it's really hard to get back that trust when, it, when everybody knows when the rubber hit the road, I threw somebody else in front of the, in front of the bus instead of, taking the heat myself. And I, and I think in leadership where I see when you set the goal, like say transparency is very important. If that's what you're saying, transparency is really important for this organization to work well, well then you have to be transparent. Or if I say trust is the key to leadership, I have to be trustworthy, right? And I can't just do the expedient thing. And I think that's some, a little bit of the whole manager versus leader thing. Some people, when you're just managing, it's like, well, it's going to be a lot easier for me to just tell Milos whatever, whatever he wants to hear and worry about it two months from now when he comes back and asks me again. Maybe he'll forget. You know, I know I can't do that. I can't do that. I have to be honest and upfront. And that's, you know, I think you build the culture by through your behavior and through the, the teams you build and the behavior that you encourage, you know, in addition to your own behavior and what you allow, right? You're absolutely right. You made a number of great points, right? Pro providing air cover for your team. You praise in public, you correct in private if it needs to be uh, corrected. And... Um, I've had conversations and I'm glad you brought up trust because I think it's foundational for everything we do. Because if I don't trust you, am I going to include you or you don't trust me? Are you going to include me in all the conversations and the plans and the strategies? Are you going to ask for my opinion? Um, are you going to share all the information freely? The answer is probably no to all of those if there's no trust. And then how can we win together as a team if we're on the same team, kind of wearing the same jersey, right? With the, with the same logo um, if we're not trusting each other. Um, but I've had a conversation for a number of years with some of my friends and colleagues, and I think I was able to convert um, most of them. And it goes this way. Um, some of them have said, and these are conversations that have taken place many years ago, but um, I think I still have one or two are holdouts, but I think they're coming over to the dark side. And their, their approach was, People have to come in and earn my trust, right? They have to come in, work 
for me, not with me, work for me and earn my trust over the first six months, nine months, a year, year and a half. But yet they expect those same people, right? To give right. their trust to them on a platter on day one, which I think are unfair, unreasonable expectations that um, are not equitable, that are not fair, and that are putting everybody in a position where you're almost setting yourself a failure, whether you are aware of that, whether you realize it or not. So what's important to understand is modeling behavior. It's what you said, what you talked about. It's the modeling behavior. You need to be that example of treating people with the right way, treating people with respect, and hopefully that carries over across the rest of the team. And you need others, no matter what their org chart placement may be, you need others to also step up as leaders and help kind of channel that energy in the right direction. One of the things that I strongly believe in, again, one man's opinion, is that leaders need to be willing to take some risks, right? Playing it safe, I, I believe my experience has always been that when some, it needs to be calculated and thoughtful and not reckless, but playing it safe all the time, your upside is always going to be limited, right? No great right. woman or a man has ever accomplished anything in the history of the world sitting comfortably on their three-legged stool or their couch, right? It hasn't happened. You got to get out there. You got to take some risks. You got to stick, stick your neck out and see where it goes. Now, in order to take some risks, right, in, and here's where I'm going with this, uh, leaders who are willing to take risks, who are willing to shape the culture in that particular area, in that particular direction, in order to better and reimagine their organization, need to be able to empower and infuse innovation. Right. When you hear the word innovation, what does it mean to you? How are you going about it? Is it enough of your focus today? Um, or do you believe that people like yourself and me and others should be spending a lot more, a lot more of their time outside customer facing, looking ahead of the curb um, instead of at some occasions keeping the lights on? Well, I, I think what happens a lot of times when I, when I think of innovation, you know, a, kind of a, a resource strapped, uh, higher, you know, higher education entity. I'm kind of like innovation, ugh, you know, that's Google or something. But, but in reality, we can all be innovative in the sense that we don't have to just keep repeating and keep, we have to keep the lights on, but that doesn't mean we need the same light fixtures with the same light bulbs in the same order. Right. And what, I try to encourage my teams to do is, and, and I'm not, I'm not really a fan of the out of the box thing, like out of the box. I don't really like that phrase that much, but to think, I think more, it's like we're looking through a telescope. We are, we're kind of in this path. So, all right, well, we've always, whatever, used XYZ software to do this thing. And there's a, there's a problem. And it's kind of like, okay, why are we using that tool for that? Because it doesn't really accomplish the goal correctly. And many times, and, and I was guilty of this too. When I sometimes I have conversations with my teams now, and I'm like, oh yeah, this was me when I'm like, yeah, that's the way this software works, and that's the way they wrote it, and you just have to press this key when you get to this point. I, I understand that that's the way that software works, but do we have to use this widget to accomplish this goal? Maybe we don't have to be in this software at all to do this thing. So sometimes innovation is small, like with a small I. And I think now in this new, in this, uh, at least for some period of time, cash strapped environment or resource strapped environment where we have people who are sick, you know, our students are dealing with all kinds of hardships, our staff, faculty are dealing with hardships, and maybe we are, we may have enrollment or funding challenges. 
looking at how do we keep, like you were saying before, how do we keep taking the friction out of it? How do we look at it, the process as, as a whole? Because what we're usually good at is at technologists is like, this is a 10 step process and you got to step eight and it didn't work. So how do we get from eight to nine? Well, sometimes it doesn't need to be a 10 step process. It could be a five step process, maybe, right? Or maybe we don't need to use it. It's like, uh, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. nail. <laughs> Sometimes we don't have to use those particular tools that are causing the friction, like you're saying. You know, what I'm seeing is we have a lot of, not just our students, but the faculty, staff, the administrators, everybody's dealing in a very high stress environment. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that one extra step is just like, it's too much. I can't do it right now. It's not going to happen unless you can take the friction out of it. So that's where I'm looking at the innovation of how do we take what we have, use it to the best, best of our ability, and anything we're going to add, tools, technology, people, services, how do we use what we have and get the most out of what, what we're able to put to the problem. And I don't waste. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Innovation does not need to be, you know, coming up with the wheel, fire, alternating current, right? It, it can be incremental and can even at times be accidental, right? If you look at how through history, how penicillin was discovered, right? How right. Uh, telegraph and a bunch of other things, uh, assembly line. There's a lot of things that were, someone was intentional about and pursued for a very long time, building on work of those who came before them and then they finally had the breakthrough and some were pure accidents and some were very small and incremental at that moment but at the end made a huge difference right if you're taking a particular path and you're going along a straight line if you just make a, a one degree or two degree adjustment it doesn't look like much but now fast forward two or three years later your outcome your place where you're going to end up is quite different than the one you would have ended up if you didn't make that change, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, now, when it comes to, so this, the podcast is a vision, really one of the things I talked about earlier is, is as a series, as two series or two taglines, one is and interestingly for me, and fortunately for me, you, you address them both. One is CIO Chronicles and learning from fellow CIOs across the, across the country and across the world of their thoughts and experiences. And the other one is really confessions of a frustrated executive. And I, when I say frustrated, I mean, what are some of the challenges? I know uh, I have a number of myself, but what are some of the challenges that you've experienced or frustrations either currently or throughout your career that you either had to deal with or you're still trying to figure out how to deal with and are kind of looking for maybe guidance yourself? What are the, some of those things in with some uh, in your role in your experience that puzzled you for a very long time and did you have an answer to them do you have an answer to them and are you still looking for ways to do them differently i i think that the thing that puzzles me in leadership is the is t territoriality in you know i've been working in higher ed for a long time and the, you talk about being siloed right and you talk about, um, so since we're in IT and you, like you said, there's that hub and spoke and we kind of touch everybody and we know how this person doing this in an exp you know, easy way for them makes these people over here life completely miserable, but yet they're in different silos. So nobody's ever going to do anything about this. Now, I, I think as, as IT leaders, we often try to influence and like, you know, I know that you don't care about this, but we could actually help our students over here if you did this one thing differently. But, but the, what's interesting to me is like on, uh, on resources and funding. And, and I, I think this, this crisis is putting a light is shining a light on some of these decisions that, you know, you and I were talking about like the funding model, how everything runs through IT, but yet maybe 2% of the budget goes there. Right. Right. And I mean, I've always looked at 
when my budget, whatever amount of control I have over it, is really just a big piece of the institution's checkbook. It don't, there only is one checkbook. So if I spend $500 for a thing I could have spent $100 on, someone else there can't, me, whether it be me or not, can't spend that $400. And that's something that has always driven me crazy is the people that are like, well, this is my budget. I have to spend every single dollar, you know, and come, come to you, you know, like, can I buy some computers? I have some, you know, we'll talk about like how, how the control is out of control later. I'm not even talking about that part of it, but it's like, wait, don't you realize that if you spend money on that, like you are complaining that we can't, give laptops to students. Well, obviously we can't do it if we're spending money just to get, just to kind of remove it from the books, right? right? So my budget stays the same next year or whatever it is that I'm concerned about. So that's the thing that's always, especially uh, having gone through an MBA program and you're looking at like how you manage the whole business is like, well, it really doesn't make any sense if I blow a hundred thousand dollars because I can over here and I can't get $50,000 over here for something we all agree is important, right? Absolutely. And it's, that's uh, something. Yeah, the, uh, this, this pandemic has uncovered many truths, right? I, I strongly believe in that. And, and what you're saying is, is reducing the friction and breaking down silos is what seems to be the theme that I think is really going to be valuable to all of those who decide to act on it. Right, because we can talk about all of these things at nauseum until you and I are both blue in the face. But unless we take action and actually, again, risk certain things and put certain things forward and decide collectively as a unit, this is our priority for us of the next three to six months. That's what we're going to invest in. These some of these other things can hold their line for a semester or two, and then we're going to get to them later because this is the foundational block or this is the one that's going to give us additional revenue and additional you know, student success or, or reduce additional friction that's currently creating other um, headaches, um, we're never going to be as, as successful individually. And I absolutely agree with you. That's, that's a really good point. Um, that's one, I w- wasn't one of the things that I was thinking about when you started speaking, but now that you, you share that, I'm like, Ooh, that's the, I've seen that. I've seen that many times. Right? This is my budget. I decide how to spend it. And even if I don't need that last 10%, you know, come May or June, by June 30th, I'm going to go spend it. Um, because I want to get it again next year, right? And that mentality of maybe me or my team ahead of all of us collectively is to the detriment of us all. Now, as someone who has a, has a vast experience, and you have obviously started when you were seven, right? But has a, has a vast experience in, in information technology and leadership and, and higher education. Um, what are some of the, what, what's, what's some of the advice or d- different guiding lights and, and ideas that you would have to share for those who aspire to a role such as the one you occupy today? Well, I think I, I got some great advice for, from a, from a, a leader that I worked with who said, you know, there's, there's no um, way out of just showing up. So you know, you have to be there, you have to volunteer, you have to um, go out on a limb, take some risks. I mean, yes, asking for more work always brings you more work later on, right? Um, And the better you are at things, the more you get to do. And, but I think one of the things I really uh, focus on a lot is how can we get more women in technology? We, tech, I look at technology because that's, that's my expertise. And I talk to younger women and, and many times they're like, well, I just don't want to do what you do. What you do is hard. Like, I want to sit over here and write code or something. Like, what you're doing is difficult. And I think it doesn't need to be that difficult if we're empowering the people around us to, to work together and be successful as a group. You know what I mean? I think a lot of leadership is, 
if you're not doing a good job of building your team and empowering your team so they can go out and do great things, yeah, you're spending a lot of time putting out fires. But what uh, what we can really do is get ahead of things, set the tone, set set the, our goals, right, and then try as we're doing for the rest of the organization, do it within the organization. How do I get the friction out of your day, out of your interactions, out of the tools you're using? How do I get the friction down so that you can be successful? And and some of that is just, you know, some of it is being there, right? I, I, I think sometimes just being there and saying, well, there's a woman CIO. Okay, there's, there's at least one. There's way more than just one of us. There's lots of us, but, you know, being there and being willing to talk about our experiences, hopefully makes a difference, you know? That's a great point and a, and a great area that I think all of us and especially male CIOs, right? Need to spend more time on. I see this all the time. I've seen from the research I've done to my own uh, career experience across different institutions, Women tend to be around 20% uh, on most teams. And when it comes to leadership, that number in higher ed is still better than some of the other industries, which makes it really bad if you really look at it. If you look at Fortune 500 right. CEOs, let's say, or Fortune 500 CIOs, that number is single digit percentage. Like we'll have four. Yeah, we've actually lost ground over time. Right. Which is really sad. Right. We're going to have like four or seven or 8% which makes no sense to me. I agree. And I wonder how much of that is, do you think is women um, seeing it as something that perhaps is difficult or not as exciting or maybe not as creative? Because I do believe that uh, most women, if you were to, I mean, this is, I get in trouble for saying this with some folks, but overall, I think more women are creative than more men, right? I think you, you think differently, uh, you, you, and maybe women look at technology or IT is very kind of the old school engineering. You talked about 10 step process or eight step process, right? Very broken down sequential. And that's not creative enough. Doesn't get my creative juices flowing. That'll be part of that. Or how much of that is our educational system that you and I are in, right? Well, do you look at computer science or IT or some of these other majors, even there, um, a lot of women start, but when it comes to the graduation date, Fewer finish, fewer finish because they've moved into different areas, whether it's marketing or finance or something else. Right. I think some, some of it is just not being able to picture yourself there because you haven't seen, well, first of all, maybe you have no idea what a CIO does. I mean, I have a 17 year old daughter who has gone to work with me over many years and she, I still don't think she has any idea what I do. Even <laughs> now when we're in the same house together, I'm not sure she knows what, what I do. But, and I've, I've tried to, I've mentored women who, uh, you know, were like, I don't want to do all that leadership stuff. I think it's a lot of, like, you're, even more analytical women, they're like, I don't know that it's, that I'm going to accomplish a lot. You know, they don't see, there's more of an, a direct output when you're in a technical role, coding or implementing software. But also, it, it's really, it was interesting to me when I first moved into leadership and I sat at a table with men that I'd worked with for many, many years who had come to me for uh, technical problems all the time. And all of a sudden, I said something, nobody heard me, and two minutes later, a guy said the same thing. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's a great idea. And I was like, what? What just happened here? It's yeah. weird that, and I know that, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to say that these men are, you know, misogynist because I don't think they are. It's just, there's a weird thing that happens when you get to a certain level of leadership and there's a weird cultural dynamic there. And I think we just have to kind of shake it up by challenging some of those norms and and it, like we taught we discussed a little bit earlier like the panel where it's a whole it's a bunch of men and you don't necessarily notice that until later and you're like wait a minute why were there no women on this panel yes you're absolutely right one of the things that i talked about before we started recording was i was in a panel many times um and this is 
Manhattan, New York. Uh, Seattle's across different industries and you kind of sit there and you meet them a few minutes before you get on a stage and you do the whole thing. And the next day, some of these organizations will send you pictures and videos if you want to use for your own kind of promotional materials. And so you have it and so forth. And it really hits me the next day. I look at it and I'm like, wait, there was nine of us or eight of us in the panel and it's eight guys, right? Representing supposedly right. seven different industries. I'm like, how is that possible? I know. I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge challenge. And I think that we need to uh, find a way to address it. Whether some people make those decisions being aware of what they're doing or they're more subconscious either way. Um, I think it's important to get more people up to the levels of leadership that they would have no issues and no trouble handling and addressing themselves. As long as people are there and do what they love to do and what they're good at, um, I think we have to find a way, whether it's through educational systems, undergrad programs, certificates, mentorships. I mean, that's a really great opportunity that when you share that you mentor a number of women, uh, we got to find a way collectively as an industry, higher ed, higher ed first. And then I think we can set an example for others to get more women into leadership positions because I've worked for women who were remarkable, who I would work for again today, right? And I've worked for men who I would never work for again, right? So stereotyping anybody on one side or the other based on the gender is just ignorant and foolish and uneducated. Um, we talked for a while. I, I kind of lost track is exactly when we started, but we're towards the end and how I envision this being the episode number one, I think in order to kind of keep the engagement, the conversation going after you and I are done with this episode, and hopefully we'll do this again, is for you to ask a question of the audience. Is there anything that you would like to know that interests you, whether it's when it comes to leadership, when it comes to higher ed, CIO, other roles, I know a bunch of CIOs. I'm not saying you're one of them, but I'm not saying you're not. I know a number of CIOs who have aspirations to go into COO roles, who have aspirations to become university presidents and so forth. What's, what's front and center uh, for you at this point? What, what I would love to know is how people are, how other CIOs are going past the, the uh, crisis mode and into not new normal, but hey, this is a disaster that's not what we were expecting. Like, when we, you know, we we're talking about disaster, recovery. We're always thinking of, like, something happened to the building. There's a flood. There's a, you know, we can't get to a building. We're always thinking about this physical thing. And now it's like the physical thing is just fine. We're just not allowed to be there. So, so how do we, now that we realize that, the disaster isn't always on that list of things we've been expecting. How do we plan for the unplanned? I think it's a wonderful you know? question. I think it's a wonderful question. I hopefully we're going to get a lot of answers with folks who are, have thought this through. I, we started thinking about it in my organization uh, a few weeks ago, and I can't say that we have all the answers. There's a lot out there that we still don't know. You're actually, you look at insurance, you look at all kinds of things that policies you've had, and you've addressed all of these things, except this one that happened to shut the world down for months, right? You look at right. some of these other plans, business continuity, disaster recovery. You know, what happens if I lose power? I'll just you fail over to Amazon in Northeast or Vegas or somewhere else. But what happens if, you know, a pandemic occurs, right? And there are, I think, great lessons for us all out of this. And I'm just hopeful that we will learn that we're not gonna to fall to our own ailment as humanity. And that is that our shelf life or half life of our memory is sometimes short, you know, six months later, some people right. might forget and say, I oh, just, sorry, that will never happen again. Let's just move on the old way. So hopefully we'll all learn. Um, I wanna thank you for your time, for your knowledge, your experience. It's been an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. We know each other for a while. You're both a, a friend and a colleague, and I'm very grateful for you um, starting this off with me. We'll see where this goes and how it grows, hopefully, over the years. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your knowledge and experience, and I look forward to us collaborating together. 
and hopefully at some point, not too distant future, grabbing that cup of coffee together. Thank you very much. Sounds great. Thank you. This was Trisha Clay, Chief Information Officer, a friend and a colleague, a woman who has done great work, and she's only starting. Have a wonderful day and keep moving forward.